Hey there, are you ready for the truth? The whole truth and nothing but about relationships. Here's one. Just talking about your feelings doesn't work, but changing your behavior does. So says Stacy Bartley, a relationship expert, host of the Love Shack Live podcast, and the author of the new book, Feeling Like Your Marriage is Dead, a divorce mediator's guide to ensuring a lifetime of love. A lifetime. Who wouldn't want that? Welcome to Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson. I'm your host, Dr. Mo, best-selling author, award-winning podcast host, keynote speaker, and speaker coach. My goal for every episode is to elevate, educate, and motivate you personally and professionally, which is why I interview guests like Stacy Bartley. You can't say Dr. Mo ain't tell ya. you that fear magnifies the consequences of failure. What are you scared of? Why are you afraid? I'd rather live like I'm dying than live to die any day. My heart is pure, my soul is safe. Welcome, Stacy. Oh, thank you, Dr. Mo. It's such a pleasure to be here and share with your listeners. I appreciate the opportunity. You are most welcome. The pleasure is mine. Let's jump right in. As a divorce mediator, you've seen many examples of failing in love. To borrow a phrase from your book, I'll give you credit for that. (laughs) Do you think, Stacey, have we romanticized love and marriage too much? Mm. You know, sometimes that's a tough question because sometimes I think we romanticize it too little. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is our relationships very often become very logistical, very practical, very performance oriented. And oftentimes that's about the moment that that wonderful feeling of romance and delight and pleasure and passion falls away. And so I think uh, it's more of the expectations that we have of ourselves and relationships and and commitment and marriage. Um, Those tend to be things that we want to have give us guarantees that it's going to be okay, that it's going to last the long haul. Mm -hmm. Um, And unfortunately, there's nothing that can give us that, especially when it comes to relationships, it's it's a risk. However, if we were to maybe enjoy the relationships more, maybe bring in more romance and pleasure when we get stressed and anxious, et cetera, mm-hmm. um, I propose the idea that it would go much, much better and that it would be much easier for us to work through our difficulties. So not so much a romance problem. I think that we leave the romance at the door and we don't realize that pleasure is part of what we need to seek as the counterbalance to the challenges and stress that we feel. And sometimes that's an oxymoron. You know, we have these interesting thoughts and illusions in our heads that go, no, 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 no. We can't have pleasure. We haven't solved the problems yet. No, 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 no. We can't have fun. We can't go there yet. Right. I'm, I'm mad. I'm ticked. We got a situation and yet oftentimes that's the best counterbalance because then once you let go, pleasure helps us relax. It helps us let go. It helps us exhale, spinning up and becoming more rigid and anxious and uptight Mm -hmm. is not going to help us solve the problem. There you go. That's a gem right there. As they say in in my my Baptist tradition, pass the plate. We can (laughs) build a benediction because what you brought out and I love is that at those stressful, difficult, tense times is the time to bring in the romance. And I I mean, even speaking from experience, that's the last thing in the world I want to do. I'm like, get away from me. I'm mad. I want to talk to you. I don't want to be in the same room. I don't want to look at you. And we just make the problem worse. So I I like what you just said, that that's important. And it's a very different way of looking at things than we see anywhere. I mean, even, you know, our movies, our books, everything is just the opposite behavior of what it sounds like is good advice that we need to be doing from a divorce mediator, a trained uh, relationship expert. You know, in your book, which I enjoyed, you speak of the human navigation system. And you wrote this about balance. When I am out of balance on the physical side, I will run around with my checklist of things to be done, scramble to figure things out. And for the life of me, I can't sit still and be still. To bring me back into balance, I need to sit my butt down and feel the beating of my heart and focus my mind on my breath. 
This brings my physical body and emotional body into connection with each other. Why is personal balance important in a relationship? Well, because in relationships, we show up as good as we feel. Mm -hmm. Period. That's a hard period. And so if I don't feel so good, I'm not going to show up so good. And then we attempt to control our environments, to control other humans, to control other people. And so when we are emotionally overwhelmed, our bandwidth is very, very small. And I react instead of, right, respond. I mm -hmm. act out instead of, right, take that space and time that I need to kind of let my navigation system catch up with each other. And, and if I may, let me just explain a little bit about that because- yeah. In our navigation system, our physical side also has our brain. <laughs> so our brain does all the thinking and the strategy and the rationalization. And we're all very familiar with that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's this whole emotional side of our navigation system. And that's the side that we're not very familiar with. We don't understand a lot about because we don't mm -hmm. talk about it. We don't learn about it. So my emotional body has the ability to feel everything right now. Like I can be fine, 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 not fine mm -hmm. <laughs> in a nanosecond, right? Sure. I can be overwhelmed. However, I'm not going to understand why until my brain has the ability to catch up, i.e. understand why it is I'm feeling the way that I'm feeling and to be able to identify what's going on and to the best of my ability, understand why I'm here and feeling the way that I am. By contrast, my brain can only process a very small fraction of what my emotional body can feel in a nanosecond. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't understand that, then we're going to react because I show up as good as I feel. And then it's going to be the hindsight. It sounds a lot like this, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. Or, oh my gosh, why didn't I say that? That would be brilliant, <laughs> right? And right. that's that's a sign that this is all caught up. And now you're making sense, right, of what just happened and the way that I felt. And we don't understand that. And so oftentimes we just allow the emotions to rule. And then the thinking comes after the fact. And unfortunately, the thinking then is more regret or guilt or frustration or disappointment because of how I did show up. As many of my clients say, this relationship is turning me into a monster of myself. And that is a high sign that I just don't understand what's playing out and why I can't get a handle on the way I feel. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because I'm reacting instead of knowing what else to do which is that digestion down of my emotional body, the understanding of where I am. And that's why I sit, sit your butt down, <laughs> just sit right, your butt right. down and create some spot, some space and a pause so that you can allow that to catch up and you can make some sense of how you're feeling before you step in and react, before you have those difficult conversations, before you step to the table. And, and gosh, if you're in the middle of a difficult conversation and it was going well and it was going well, and then it wasn't going well, create that pause space and come back to it. It doesn't really matter how many rounds it takes to get through a difficult situation or to solve a problem or to feel mm -hmm. understood. What does matter is the way we go about it. So if we think of it in rounds where I can pause, I have a break, I can come back to this when I'm in a better place. And, and I'm Okay. Is that, is that the same day though, when you're talking rounds yeah. or it can it be days in between or just whatever works for you? Yeah, I, the important piece is that you just declare it, you know, it could be 30 minutes, it can be tomorrow, you know, at breakfast, it can mm -hmm. be tonight after we put the kids to bed, just declare the time where you're going to come back and, and attempt to take another stab at it, like go, go another round. And with every round, you're going to understand and disclose more things about yourself, and more things about the person or persons you're trying to gain some understanding. Well, right. That, and, that declare part, I want to just pause there for a moment because, you know, I think what you're saying is very real and very true. And we're all learning in this continuous journey, but different people need different amounts of time of their break of their space. But And when you have that in your mind and you don't say it, though, it just leaves the other person in such a, you know, a state of, of fear and dread and uncertainty. But if you know, I mean, we can put up with almost anything if we know there's going to be an end to it. So why is it, I mean, I've seen it a lot that people don't declare it. They just go cold, just go silent. Is is it because it's something they learned or 
Is that human nature? Yeah, well, I, I think the human nature or the survival mode in us causes us to just clam up and shut up. Like, mm -hmm. like if we don't know what to do, that's going to be our natural reaction. We clam up, we shut up, and we pull out. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know what else to do, and I don't want to make it worse. <laughs> I don't want to make a bigger mess of this, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be our, our reaction. The reason we don't declare it is simply because we weren't taught. We didn't know that that was an option. We didn't realize we did have a brake pedal. When you think about when we step in to have conversations, we just go for it. And yes. in fact, there's terrible advice about don't go to bed mad. I mean, that's the worst advice on the planet. Oh, oh yeah, I never went with that. <laughs> Please go to bed, Matt. Oh, no. Oh, no. I, I'm mad. Leave me alone. And I, it is what it is. I don't care what kind of scriptures you throw at me. This is what's happening. This is what it's terrible. And so we jump in and we cross our fingers and hope it's going to go well. But as we're feeling the escalation going up inside of ourselves, or we see it in the people that we're trying to communicate with, we just we just continue. You know, there's no, hey, and long before we're redlining, right, mm -hmm. we can say, hey, let's let's just take a pause. And and the, the important piece is that we do declare it, because if we don't declare it, we're leaving the other person hanging. And it's not this is not a mechanism to put it in the closet or sweep it under the rug and hope it never comes back around. Right. This is I am becoming escalated or I'm checking out, we can go either direction. Um, some of us like check out and go missing. And some of us, you know, escalate and escalate and escalate. And then it's like, ah, mm -hmm. ah, you know, yeah, um, right. that never takes us to a good place. I just want to reassure you and the listeners that when we finally get to the place where we're redlining, there has never been, and I don't think there ever will be, a moment where both sides go, you know what, good point. Mm -hmm. I understand where you're coming from. Eureka, I finally get it. It never goes like that. It's usually hurt feelings, disappointment. We say things we don't mean. Um, we behave in ways that we do feel like that monster inside of ourselves. And sometimes we shock ourselves in regards to what came out of our mouths, what we did, what we said, how we behaved. Right. And that's going to be the thing that keeps us up at night. Good, right. So good. if we Wait. can just say 30 minutes, let's come back to this in 30 or tomorrow morning or give me some yeah. time. With Let this. the rolling boil go back down. A quick definition of redlining for in case the listener's not familiar with that term, would you define what you mean when you're saying redlining? Yeah, it just means I all of a sudden lose control of myself. Either that's in a collapsed state where I leave the room, I slam the door, I just get the heck out of Dodge, or I'm not listening to you anymore. I kind of go stone cold, or I can redline also in the, the push, the control, the, the can't stop right now mm -hmm. I'm out of control and now I'm just doing things and saying things all over the place. So yeah. that's what I call redlining. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. I just like to make sure, you know, we're all on that's the same great page point. and we use, use words in different way and that I don't want anyone to miss what you're, what you're saying. So thank you for that uh, great definition. So let's move to the next question. Why does simply striving to improve communication uh, not fix relationships, which is kind of how I started with introducing you. Mm -hmm. well, I love this question. And thank you so much for asking it. We all know intuitively that when things are breaking down in our relationships, we got to talk about it, right? Uh, when right? We intuitively know that we've been taught that. And so, you know, we all feel that communication is at the heart of our relationship. And it is to some degree, because if we can't share ourselves, we can't connect, we can't create understanding, we can't create forward progress. However, we're not going to be able to um, improve our communication until we can do what I just talked about a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Because when our emotional backs get pressed against the wall, you're going to react and you're going to do what you traditionally do, even though I could teach you some really great communication frameworks, you know, and I could teach you the words and I can teach you why, and I can break it all down for you, which I, I do and can do. Mm -hmm. But when your emotional back gets pressed against the wall, you're going to do what you always do. You're not going to give two rips about that communication framework I just taught you. That's not where you're going to go. Right. You're going to go into reaction mode instead. And so we need to begin with what I call emotional weightlifting. 
right? We need to begin with being able to emotionally regulate ourselves. So if we have and develop that brake pedal I just talked about, now we have the ability to go and talk about anything. Now communication frameworks will help you. And so I think oftentimes we get the cart before the horse. You know, we we think, okay, here's here's these communication principles. Now just use them and mm-hmm. it will never work. We'll chuck them. We'll, we'll, we'll chuck them. We'll get rid of them. <laughs> Good, good, good. And and to your point of the emotional push-ups and the emotional weight lifting, it, at least what I've found for myself is it doesn't make the conversations easier, but I'm better equipped to handle them. It's it's never a joyful time. It's not like you get to where, oh yay, a difficult conversation. But when you know how to navigate it, when you have the tools and techniques of communication or not communicating to facilitate it over a difficult period, you know, it is, you can, you can lift weights when you do enough reps, but I still, I can lift weights. I don't like working out, but I can lift weights and I do it for my health because I know the outcome is a good thing. Is a mm-hmm. really good thing. Well, and and if I may just add to that was yeah, yeah. beautifully, beautifully said, we don't understand and realize that emotional body, that emotional side of our navigation system needs to be worked out as well. We need to strengthen and develop our capacity emotionally to take on difficult situations. And we don't realize that. And how do I get stronger by doing it? The reality is, as a human being, the, to rip your face off, to lose it is the easiest thing in the whole wide world. That doesn't take any effort or strength whatsoever. Right. To to regulate myself, to, right? to push in the clutch, especially when it's escalating. Now that's going to require some strength and some know-how and some capacity. But that is the game changer for all of us. It is. It really is. So, you know, that's where we need to practice. And where do we go to practice this? <laughs> where do we go to practice in the emotional weightlifting gym of life, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I'm I'm coming with an emotional weightlifting gem online just because I see such a need. We need to be able to practice and develop these skills and these abilities with inside of ourselves before it actually counts with the person that we love when all the risk is on the table, right? I right. need to be able to like mess it up long before, right? It matters. And just, so it, it is a thing. It is a emotional weightlifting is a real thing and we've it, got it, to get better at it. It really is. And, and the interesting thing is, you're right, a lot of people don't have a place to practice it. But there is a large group, uh, particularly in, in corporate America or in areas where they work with teams where they do get to practice it and then cut it off when they get home. It's like those same that same manager who just had a difficult conversation or put an employee on a corrective action plan, let somebody go, you know, diffuse tenseness between other people, then they get home and leave it at the door. And it's really not broadly different skills. But I I think that's the other thing that I didn't learn until later in life is that I need to bring that those skills home to the most important place is to use that and not just default into, you know, eight year old Monica (laughs) screaming and and kicking and why can't Barbie go? You know, (laughs) (laughs) I can't Barbie go to church. Come on. (laughs) I love that. And you're so right. You know, we learn a lot of these wonderful things in the corporate world that we don't understand how to translate into our home life. We think they're very different environments. And just think about how you change personally in the incorporate setting versus the home setting. Good point. Absolutely. And that's why I say we show up as good as we feel. I feel Mm -hmm. often very empowered, maybe respected, maybe Mm -hmm. good about the job and the work that I'm doing in the workplace. And when I come home, it's going to be, you know, very different, very different experience. So I'll show up congruent with that. And, and I lost it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, and and just think about how we'll push the brakes and do emotional weightlifting at work that we won't do at home. Right, right, absolutely. Because you, <laughs> you you value that job and and uh, yeah. uh, wow, so it's, much here. Let's uh, let's talk about commitment while we're on relationships. There are you know people who are in doing doing the weightlifting, going through the gymnastics of of living with another person or being in, you know, community with another person. And then there's the group with the fear of commitment. How do we, how do they, we, yeah, I guess I could be part of that group. How do we get off right? 
Uh, let's see, 20 years single. How do we get over? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want you to know I was right there with you. I was 15 years single and swore off marriage. And, and I came from this place of, you know, I've had my kids. I don't need another man yeah. who needs one of them. Um, and I, I had I had blown up so many relationships at that point in time that mm-hmm. I just thought I'm, not, I'm never going to do this again. And then Tom came along and you'll have to read my book to get the story of Tom. I'm not going to use our time here to tell that story, but long story short, I had a a very spiritual experience with him when I was 14. And so if there was a person on the planet that could cause me to reconsider this decision and my high horse of being the independent woman who didn't need no kind of man, Mm -hmm. it would be him. And when the opportunity for us to explore a relationship became available, I was very candid with him about, I'm not going to marry. I I don't do this commitment thing because, you know, perhaps like you, I was very commitment phobic, like whatever, we'll do this until it doesn't work. And I I don't have any grand expectations about where it's going to take me because I had been through so many disappointments. So as our relationship began to progress, I knew that this conversation of marriage was coming and commitment, which is natural and normal in relationships. It's like, what are we? What are we going to do? How do we go forward? How do we build a life together? We're together all the time. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, And I started to panic. And one night late in the evening here, I knew it was coming. Here it comes. And to just ease the tension, like to just derail it, honestly, the entire conversation, I blurred out, okay, 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 look, how about a lease option? contract for love and what? that's all he can give you <laughs> and that's what he said what and then I laughed and I was like okay okay you know just gave me a minute to kind of like reset mm-hmm. and then he he called me on it and he said you know what I want you to put that together you know because I was still in the therapy space I was still in that world mm-hmm. and um, didn't focus on relationships like I do now and I went oh gosh okay well, let yeah let's do that And we set it for 30 days and I took everything I knew and I put it into this contract. And really it was about talking about what I needed and what he needed. And then the the kicker was we would do an evaluation every week. Like, how am I doing? Am I meeting your needs? Is there something I could do better? And let me coach you on what you could do for me. Here's what Mm -hmm. I'm noticing now. And what I found 90 days later after renewing this two more times is it wasn't commitment I was afraid of at all, actually. It was the ability to navigate the inevitable, right, challenges and pitfalls that were Mm -hmm. sure to come with time. Right. And when I realized we could talk about, you know, this is where I'm at and and this is the need I have and how am I doing and this doesn't work for me. And what about you? Where are you at? And we could have that conversation. It dawned on me that we could actually navigate through anything if we were having those kinds of conversations. I'm going And so the lease option contract became a framework that I still use in my practice today. And it was very valuable for people who were divorcing to get complete about what just happened in their relationship and, and also to help them understand whether they could really save their relationship or they needed to let it go just because of what everybody needed and wanted out of this relationship. Mm -hmm. I want to also point out that commitment as we know it is really dramatically changing right now before our eyes. Like we are in the throes of a revolution that we have never seen in hundreds of years. And that is the conversation around monogamy and and how do we do monogamy? And what do we do when monogamy, uh, the way that we had, you know, expected it to work, the way that it didn't work, the way that, you know, I assumed it would work, isn't working. Now, what do we do? And, And how do we have those conversations? And so wherever we fall in that, I I don't want to to cause anybody to like panic or because if monogamy is it for you, then do that. Absolutely. Okay, well, well, wait, hold up. You lost me though. What what is happening with monogamy? What is the question or is putting me in or what what is going on? Did I well (laughs) I'm I'm just saying monogamy is changing and we're starting to have different conversations about what monogamy is and how it goes and um how we work and dance with it. And I'm saying it in my practice. Okay. For for example, I'm still not quite on board. Like yeah. So for example, traditional monogamy would be you and I and that's it. Mm-hmm. And now, now I'm seeing people creating monogamous agreements about, okay, monogamy, and we're going to go explore other things together. And as long as we're together, that's our new agreement or commitment to monogamy. I right? see what you're saying. So, I see. I, I've so seen then, that trend, but I didn't know they were still calling that monogamy, that that, that was... Isn't that a okay. interesting? Uh, right? That I didn't know. 
monogamy because we're still in it together. We're still doing this together. I'm still okay. ultimately committed to you. And so we're we're seeing a huge flux, especially in the in the younger generation of okay, we're going to rewrite what monogamy means. But we don't even have to go as far as monogamy. We can we absolutely though can write the agreements of what that looks like in our in our relationships, and we've got to talk about that because we come from these um, expectations of what we were taught in our childhood and in our families of origin and in our communities and socially. And Mm -hmm. then we carry those forward. We all do. We don't know what we don't know as a human being. We never discuss it. We never talk about it. And so um, I might have my ideas of what I think monogamy are, and you might have what your thoughts of monogamy are. And oftentimes that leads to a tremendous amount of conflict in our relationship, Mm -hmm. simply because we don't talk about it. And when we do start to talk about it and we start to open up about really what are my assumptions and expectations about monogamy in our relationship, Mm -hmm. you're going to go, wow, how did you get there? Okay. I didn't know that was something that was important to you or that you valued or assumed was going to be part of us and how I show up in this relationship and vice versa. And as Tom and I were creating our relationship, there were so many of those. And in the work with my clients now, 12 years later with this same framework, there is inevitably a surprise like, oh, wow, I didn't know you thought that was part of the deal, right? Whether that's financially, whether that's around children, whether that's around expectations around the house, whether Mm -hmm. that's, you know, what a good partner looks like for me. um, Those little specific nuances are just never talked about. They just don't happen. Some of that sometimes comes up when you do pre-marriage counseling, uh, some surprising things come up. And and a lot of it is that, of course, we live in these communities where everyone is like us. You know, they're all prod, Protestant, all Hindi, all eat this, all go here, all, you know, reprimand yes. their kids in that way. And you just kind of think, oh, that's how everyone does it. And if you don't get exposed to other things, and if you don't ask those questions and not make assumptions that, those surprises come up and you're like, wait, you don't want kids? What? (laughs) Exactly. Well, and we have, we live in a spectacular time too, where we get to cross pollinate, meaning we get to have cultures and races become a part of our life, you know? And Mm -hmm. if we don't, I mean, so you want to start just really, and we have a difficult time with just us being what I call same, same, which is so boring, but when we start cross pollinating, (laughs) yeah. When we start cross-pollinating, for example, my youngest son's father is Jamaican. And what's your expectations about a relationship and how it's supposed to roll from your background and from your upbringing? Mm -hmm. And we don't realize it was very, very different than mine, which didn't make one right and one wrong. It meant that we needed to come up with a hybrid that worked in our relationship. You know, a great relationship. And agree upon it. Right. And And just impose that on the other one, right. Yeah. So this idea of agreements, monogamy agreements or a lease option contract for love is really, really significant. And and it's very important in this day and age as we're rewriting how we do this thing called love. Mm -hmm. Historically, we didn't have to do that because relationships were about other things. Relationships weren't about love. They were more about survival and money, right? And the transfer of wealth and keeping it in the family and protecting that. Um, And now that we are kind of stepping into love is for love, we want to be in places where we want to love, we want to be loved for who we are. Um, Relationships now have taken on a totally different um, flavor, shall we say, and we've got to take the obligation out of it because the obligation is what suffocates the love and the romance. So if ironically, historically, um, and I talk about this in my book. If you want a a relationship, a marriage to last the long haul, it lasts longer if it's based on some obligatory thing, not necessarily love itself. And that's what will keep the couple together for the 60 years. If you take the obligation out of it, meaning the, the religious obligation, the family obligation, right, the child obligation, Mm -hmm. then we're more likely to not see that last the long haul. Isn't that interesting? You would think just the opposite. I would. Yeah. Um, That That was really shocking to me when writing the book. It was like, oh my gosh. So actually obligation trumps love every time Hmm. in longevity. And so if we want these relationships to last, which we do, 
right? right? I say a lifetime. Why can't we create that? We can, but we've got to get very specific about our agreements and our needs and our wants. And not just one time because we're going to roll over and change as human beings. We've got to do it often because we're going to change. (laughs) Our circumstances are going to change. What I need is going to change. And that's true for your partner too. And that takes me back to fear of commitment. I have to clean this up because there'll be sisters everywhere jumping on me. We uh, <laughs> the, the fear of commitment with independent women is not necessarily about I don't need a man because I've had had guys say that to me. You know, you've got a home, you've got this, you've got that. You don't need me, and or what can I give you? And for many women, a relationship is so much more than that. Although a lot of men have been taught that you know, if, if I get you a house and a picket fence and whatever. I'm being a good guy, but the fear is that I don't want to be in a partnership or relationship where I'm the only one working and growing and communicating that that is the fear. That's where the heartbreak came in. So as you're talking about in your book and here, as you're talking about these skills to help you build lasting relationships, how do you, I mean, you can really like someone, but those pieces, you know, that that communicating part is so poor that that's the fear is that I can't, this can't be helped. I don't know how to make this better. And I don't know that I'm able to even teach this to someone. How do you get, and I'm going to say particularly a male to embrace that we've got to work on our communication here to make this work. It's not just enough to show up or pay the rent or whatever. This is what I need, particularly at this point in my life where a lot of women are more independent and not just looking for a sponsor, as they say. That was a long question, but you're nodding and you're smart. So I know you got all those words. (laughs) (laughs) No, I, you know what you're highlighting and you're pointing to is as um, women are growing in their ability to be independent, right? And to find mm-hmm. to financially provide for themselves, which historically has been provided for from a male role, as well as women's demand about the type of sex we have and about what I need emotionally finally coming to the forefront of the conversations that mm-hmm. we can actually bring to the table. Men are losing their identity and their role in the mix, and they're having to retool or re-identify what is a man in today's society. And if you're like me and most women, what we tend to do with that is, is basically get critical. We, we try and force and beg and plead and coerce and, and point out all the places where they're not doing it right. But we don't create what we don't do often is create a safe place where they can learn and retool. I find that more men than you think want to learn and grow and become better because they want to be in relationship just as much as females want to be in mm-hmm. relationship. But oftentimes, instead of like being taught and supported and helped, they're belittled, criticized, leveraged, and tossed out to much of everybody's disappointment. So a, you you used a very wonderful word called teach. It's not a woman's job to teach a man how to be a man. Right. Right. He, she can provide a safe place to have, have perhaps somebody that's skilled come along and help you with that together. Mm-hmm. Right. And we have to do it before we are totally frustrated and plugged in about not getting our needs met, because then we're just going to take it out on them instead and vice versa. Right. They get scared and are tired of being criticized and belittled and shamed and they disappear or they attack or, you know, and they're so everybody's coping in this survival Mm -hmm. mode and nobody is getting better which is what everybody really wants to do. And I truly believe that human beings, you know, (laughs) they love to be in love. They just do. And when we commit and and we decide a life together, you know, you think Mm -hmm. about being on the preparatives of that, whether it's marriage or we're just going to move in together and create a life together. Um, our intentions are so good and we are trying and, to bring our best a great selves feeling when you've had it. Oh. You know, it's, it's like that first high for the people on, on drugs or whatever. Oh, it is a high. Facing the rest of your life. Yeah. 
I call it the magic carpet ride and and just <laughs> know it is normal for that to come to a place where this, there are going to be things that don't work for me in any relationship. There right. are things that work and things that don't work in every relationship. And it's our, our limited ability to talk about the things that don't work that break down our relationships, because instead of talking about them, we're going to stop talking and sharing, and we're going to start acting and coping in other ways. So this is when I spend more time with my girlfriends or my guy friends, or I pick up my drinking a little bit or my shopping habit or my redesign, or or I, I get invested in the kids because I don't know how to talk about the things that aren't working. And so sooner rather than later, like that would be my plea sooner rather than later get support, get help, because it doesn't have to be this. You go and sit on somebody's couch and talk just about your problems. It's about tooling up and it can be fun and it can be freeing and it can bring a tremendous amount of hope and joy back into the relationship. The challenge right now that we do face is we're reluctant to get that support and that education and that training and that retooling. And we put it off until like the dang house is on fire. Fire. (laughs) <laughs> and now, you know, that's going to be rough. That's going to be a rough rebuild. If we would have done it when we first started to realize our communication was breaking down or that we were taking our emotional pain and frustrating frustrations out on each other, there would be a lot that could be done, right? A lot. So much, so much. So what are two things? Just give us two things to stay focused on in your relationship, your growing healthy relationship to ensure longevity. The first one is that brake pedal we talked about. Use it. Okay. I don't redline as best you can. That's going to be an emotional push up. It sounds really easy, but man, when you're like starting to spin, pushing that brake pedal is really difficult. Please practice that. You get good at that. You can go anywhere. Mm. Second thing that I'm going to impress upon you is a little thing called fairy dust. And this is where I call it fairy dust because you're going to remember it. And basically it's the three desires or needs that we have as a human being that we all have and that literally we all fight for. So if you ever wanted a shortcut in regards to why we're fighting, this is it. I want to feel heard because in hearing me, it validates me. It helps me feel like where I'm coming from is valuable. Mm -hmm. The second thing I'm longing for is appreciation because in relationships, we work our tails off, right? We work so hard at them. And and (laughs) even though things may not be going well, I promise everybody is doing the very best they know how. So acknowledgement and appreciation for even the smallest of things go a long, long way. And the third is we all need reassurance that this matters, that I matter, this relationship matters, that what we're trying to do here matters. And so if we know those three things, even in the middle of a fight or before we start a difficult conversation or just any old time we feel like we want to say it, please remember to acknowledge the people that you love in your life in those ways that sounds like, hey, I want to hear what you have to say. Or, hey, I really appreciate what you're doing and acknowledge you for what's going down here. I know Mm -hmm. this is really messed up, but I just want you to know I see you're trying. Or, hey, you know what? Today, I want you to know you matter to me. This relationship matters to me. And I know it's really messed up right now, but it just, I care. And sometimes we forget to say those things and all it does, it doesn't fix the problems, but it just refuels our emotional bodies enough to where it's like, yeah, I want this. It, re- it refuels me because I remind myself in the moments of the heated, heated um, times that I do care. Sometimes we forget that we do. And that's why I'm so <laughs> ticked off. <laughs> and that this is, this is something valuable to me. And we take care of and protect and cherish things that are valuable to us. Yes. Um, and, and believe me, every single human being wants to be reassured, especially when we're going through a difficult time. Yes. Yes. You know? and it, this, this goes for every relationship. I love that you're focusing on uh, marriage. I I was just talking to a friend the other day who's having a difficult time in her marriage, and she seemed to be trying to lead her way toward divorce and asking my opinion. And I said, I have never, ever recommended divorce to anyone, nor will I. I. I want you to try every other available, you know, method to bring you guys back close again. I'm not, if that's what you wanted from me, I'm not that girl. And that's why I have so many people on the program like you bringing these gems on building relationships, building communication, because, you know, you said you, you 
produce your your outcome is 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 from how you feel. Tell me again what you say. You show up like you feel. You do. You like and you there's no like way around that. We try and fake it. You show up like you feel, yeah. and that's everywhere. That is everywhere. So part of the practice is to know that and to behave in that manner at all times. And none of us are perfect, certainly not me, but to remember that that's going to stay with me this, this week <laughs> and to step on those brake pedals. I'm really, really excited about what you've shared here today about building healthy, long lasting relationships. I know your book is going to help a lot of people. I enjoyed it. The final question uh, before our listeners hang in there, because you're going to want to know how to connect and learn more about Stacy Bartley and get her book. But there is a question left that is important to be asked. How do you know when it is time to move on from your current relationship? So this is a place where I love what you said, not recommending anybody leave their their relationship. Um, when we do it in the heat of the moment, which traditionally it happens, I just take it, take it, take it, take it till I can't take it anymore. And there's going to be what I call a default option where you just, you know, just pull out the stops and go, that's it. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that leaves us in a place where we feel incomplete because we have all of these things that perhaps if I would have tried, maybe would have made the difference. Mm -hmm. So I go away from this experience feeling really bitter and incomplete, and I don't understand and know why. So the advice to your friend was beautiful. It's like, get in there and learn about yourself and how you show up in relationships and why you show up the way you do and allow your partner to do the same. Mm -hmm. and when you go through that process, it's going to tell you everything you need to know about what's available in the relationship. Then and only then make the decision about what to do next, right? Because then you're going to leave the relationship feeling complete. You know why it's not going to go on. You know and understand why you can't meet the needs of your partner or your partner can't meet your needs in the moment. And now when I step into a new relationship, which I hope everyone will, love for a lifetime doesn't need to be with one person. It just means we don't stop. We're resilient. We can heal. We can go on. And this is how we get better at love, right? The only time we don't get better at love is if we stop. Right. So as you step into a different relationship, you're going to take away so many gems uh, that you learned in this relationship that perhaps you're stepping away from, from a place of completeness, from a place of understanding, and from a place to really step in and go, this is what I'm looking for. And this is what I'm going to do better next time. Yeah. And that's all any of us can do, right? I, I just want to say this, if I may too, um, there is no wasted experience. I it agree. does not exist. Yeah. Each and every relationship that you have ever been in or will ever be in will contribute to who you are and who you're becoming. And there's so much wisdom in that. You know, I always say, if you want to put your personal growth on steroids, just go ahead and get into a relationship. It, it will bring up everything you need to look at, everything you need to understand, everything you need to know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And that's why we'll never, ever be able to not do them is because we need them for our own evolution and growth personally. So um, it's it's a journey worth taking, right? Um, right. Absolutely. A journey. a journey worth taking. And we will leave you with that. Stacy. how do the listeners connect with you online, find you on social media and, and tell us about your services and books? Oh, thank you so much for that opportunity. The easiest way for you to learn more than you ever wanted to know about me and my work <laughs> <laughs> is to simply go to my website at stacybartley.com. You can also find me wherever you have a podcast. Um, my podcast that we do weekly with my husband, Tom, is called Love Shack Live. Um, you can take a listen. Um, we have lots of great teachings there as well. And then, of course, you can find my book on Amazon. And, but you can find all those things on my website, too, and my work and my services. I would be honored to support your listeners in any way that I can. Very good. Very good. Do visit her website. She's got some nice resources on there that you can download for free. And obviously, uh, I've endorsed her book. And I think you would do well, whatever your state of your relationship to download a copy from Amazon. Stacy, again, you've been a fantastic guest. I mean, I'm a better person just for having asked you questions. <laughs> so, thank you. It's thank been you. such a pleasure here. I love what you do to keep your light and your contribution to the world going. It's helping so many. So keep going. Thank you. <laughs> Wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. 
I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group, and I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and reu. Thank you.